I am Pastor Michelle. Pastor Laura and I would like to welcome you to Renton United Methodist Church. Today we celebrate World Communion Sunday, and we remember that we are all connected together in Christ. We will also begin our stewardship campaign, remembering that there are many gifts that we share with each other. Sometimes we think that we are all alone when we're walking through a storm, but we are a covenant people. When we love God, love our neighbor, and follow Jesus, we live into our covenant and our baptismal identity. We are not alone when we walk through stormy times. God is with us, and so too is the community of faith. This morning, we will explore what it means to be in covenant with God and to live in community with each other. I invite you to take a moment now to center yourself as we prepare for worship. Please join me in our hymn of praise. Welcome to Renton United Methodist Church. My name is Nancy Cook and I am your liturgist this morning. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, our hearts are filled with anticipation as we gather virtually in this sacred space this morning. Help us to experience wonder and awe as we consider all that you have created and are creating. On this World Communion Sunday, Remind us that we are connected to one another through Jesus and that we need each other. Whenever there is hatred and division in this world, help us to work to create peace and unity, beginning with our own neighborhoods. Give us strength and courage to live in covenant with you and in community with our neighbors. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus welcomed everyone, let us be in Christ to each other. I invite you to exchange signs of peace with those who are near you. You may also use the chat function on Facebook to greet your siblings in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Our first reading this morning is from Exodus 20, 1 through 4, 7 through 9, 12 through 20, the Ten Commandments. When God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, 
so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, children. Thank you so much for joining me for children's time this morning. How are you doing this morning? I hope you're really well. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about walking. I know you know how to walk. You've been walking around your houses, and I bet you take walks around your neighborhoods. Some of you, I bet, even take walks with your dogs around the neighborhood. Walking is something that sometimes can relax us and sometimes can energize us. It's often something that we can do and uh, be able to notice the beauty of the outdoors, right? Our trees are changing color right now, and by walking outdoors, we can start to notice that. Well, I want to talk a little bit about walking this morning because of the story that we just heard about the Israelites who've been walking in the wilderness and in the desert for so long. They've been walking and walking and walking, and we have been reading their stories and kind of walking with them as they've been doing that. And there's going to be a song in just a minute that we're going to hear that's all about walking as well. The song was not originally written about the Israelites, but we picked it because it kind of goes along with the Israelites walking in the desert. But the song is actually from a musical. The musical is called Carousel. And in the musical, there's a dad who is singing this song to his daughter. And he's singing this song, and its, it's title is, You'll Never Walk Alone. And he is telling his daughter that no matter what happens to her, no matter how scared she is, or no matter if anything were to happen that would confuse her, that he will always be looking out for her. You'll never walk alone. And to me, that's kind of the same message as when God was walking with the Israelites and saying, you'll never walk alone. I'll always walk with you through this wilderness and through this desert and through this confusing time. Now for the Israelites, God appeared like a fiery pillar out in front of them. We don't have that. We don't have God appearing as a fiery pillar, but we have God walking with us anyway. We can tell that God is walking with us because we can feel God in our hearts. And we can also sometimes hear God's voice in the voices of the people around us that we trust and who can lead us. And so we have to pay attention a little bit, maybe more than the Israelites who were following God with a fiery pillar, but we still can detect God with us and we know that God will never let us walk alone. So let's say a prayer together and then we'll listen to that song. Dear God, we thank you for the ways that you are always walking with us. We thank you that we never walk alone. We ask that you would show your presence to us in ways that we can understand so that we can make sure that we follow you carefully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's listen.
Our scripture gospel reading this morning is from Matthew 21, 33 through 46, the parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, You have never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who, fail, who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I first heard the song, You'll Never Walk Alone, at my sister's high school graduation. I was just eight years old at the time and hadn't lived much life yet, but that hauntingly sweet melody and powerful lyrics brought tears to my eyes. When you walk through a storm, keep your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never be alone. I knew those lyrics were true because I knew that wherever I went in life, God would walk with me. What I didn't understand at that tender age of eight years old is that it's not just God who walks with me, but also the community of faith who walks with me as well. Of course, when I first heard this song, I had not yet experienced deep disappointments in life, griefs, or even bumps in the road, though I was afraid of the dark. The truth of this song is that throughout our life, we will experience many storms. We may not be able to achieve our dreams. There is wind and rain. We might lose a job or a home or a friendship or even a loved one. We may have to relocate. We could lose our health and our physical abilities. We might even experience a worldwide pandemic and struggle with the world and a church that looks very different. My oldest daughter was studying in York, UK when everything began to close down in March. She was working on a Master of Science degree. She was able to get home after the university decided to go completely online, but it was a nail biter if she was going to be able to find a flight back to Seattle that wouldn't get canceled. She's still working on her degree, but she has shared with me recently her grief of loss of what was. You know, being in York before the pandemic, the pre-COVID life, and I know we're all struggling with the realities that the pandemic has brought us and the loss of our pre-COVID lives as well. And yet, we're reminded in that song that in all of this, we are not walking alone because we know God is walking with us. And so too is the community of faith. 
In Exodus, we hear God sharing the Ten Commandments with Moses. God has delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt to freedom, but they were still in the wilderness. They weren't quite ready to go to the Promised Land. God made a new covenant with Moses and the people. God would be the be with the people and protect them, and they would be faithful to God. Following the Ten Commandments was just part of covenantal living. Notice that being faithful to God was not about the individual. It was about being in community with each other. Listen to the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. Do not worship other gods or make idols. Do not make wrongful use of God's name. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. Do not murder. Be faithful in marriage. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not have lust in your heart. And do not covet what others have. Notice how many of those commandments are about living in community with others. We will hear next week what the Israelites were doing while Moses was on the mountain with God receiving those commandments. But suffice it to say that it would take more time in the wilderness for the Israelites to learn how to live in covenant with God and with each other before they would be ready to move to the promised land. It is not always easy living into the covenant with God particularly because covenant living is not just about the individual, but it also includes the community of faith. In our gospel today, Jesus shared a parable about a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and built a watchtower. He leased it to the tenants and went away. When harvest came, he sent his slaves to collect the produce, but the unexpected happened. First, the people beat one, killed another, and stoned another. He tried again with other slaves. No results. So finally, he sent his son. The people killed him because they reasoned if the son was dead and when the owner died, the property would become unoccupied land and it would then become the property of the first one who would claim it. They could kill the son and then become the legal property owners in time. Jesus shared this parable in the temple just a few days before he was arrested, tried, and crucified. The chief priests and Pharisees were outraged when they heard Jesus tell this parable because they understood that this parable was about judgment and that it was about them, and that Jesus was implying that they were not living in covenant with God. They really wanted to have him arrested immediately, but they waited because they feared the wrath of the crowd who believed Jesus to be a prophet. They did not like the implication that they had broken the covenant with God and therefore that they would be cast out of the kingdom of God. Nor did they like the implication that others who did not believe, that they did not believe were part of the covenant, would be allowed into the kingdom of God. The chief priests and Pharisees were angry, but this was not the first time that the people of God heard that they were being unfaithful to their covenant with God. Listen to these verses from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, what did it yield? Why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. 
Now, many theologians believe this scripture was the basis for the parable that we heard today. Isaiah told the people that they were out of covenant with God. God planted the vineyard to yield grapes, but instead it yielded wild grapes. God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and delivered them into the promised land after making a covenant with the people. The people broke that covenant, and now instead of grapes, the vineyard yielded wild grapes. And verse 7 gets more specific. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. God expected the people to be faithful to the covenant, but they were not. God expected the people to yield the fruits of justice and righteousness, but they did not. Isaiah delivered this message, but the people ignored him. So, after hearing our, our gospel, who is in and who is out? Those who are faithful to the covenant and produce fruit for the vineyard are in, and those who are not faithful to the covenant are out. We cannot be faithful to the covenant unless we are also caring for the community and working toward justice, God's justice. We are reminded that the kingdom of God includes all who love God and care for their neighbors and are working towards God's justice. Today is World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday began in 1930 when Dr. Hugh Thompson Kerr, a Presbyterian pastor at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, invited other churches to celebrate communion on the first Sunday in October. He had noticed deep divisions among people and churches, and he hoped that when the churches would celebrate World Communion Sunday, that they would remember all of the many churches around the world who were also celebrating communion that day. And that would remind everyone that while we may have our differences, that we are one in the spirit. He hoped that this would create a spirit of Christian unity and ecumenical cooperation among the churches. When we work together, we create God's justice in the world. When we work together, we help create unity in the world. When we work together, we see that the kingdom of God is bigger than we think and produce, then, the fruits for the kingdom. We can see what happens when we work together as a community Others who are experiencing storms in their life know that God and the community of faith are walking with them through all of the many ways that we cooperate and our outreach. On October 13, REACH, Renton Ecumenical Association for Churches, will be celebrating their 50th anniversary at their online gala. And if you're interested in attending, go to their webpage, which is www.reachrenton.org, and you can sign up. Both Kennedale and Renton First, the two churches that merged to become Renton United Methodist Church, were founding members of REACH. And REACH does really important work in our community by helping people who are struggling know that they are not walking alone. As the community of faith in Greater Renton, people who are hungry are fed through the Community Meals Program, and people who have lost their homes have shelter and have friends who are helping them to find new housing through the Center of Hope. It is easier to walk on through the storms with hope in our heart when we know that we are not walking alone because God and the community of faith are walking with us. We also see this in our congregation as well. We see this through masks that are made and then given away, through food that is collected and shared, and meals that are made and also shared, and the prayers that are lifted up for those who are struggling. We see this through cards that are sent and received and phone calls that are, are given to check in with each other and our Zoom visits. In the storms, through the pandemic, with the wind and the rain, we live into our baptismal identity when we live the covenant to God and with each other. We know, and others know, that we're not walking alone. When you walk through a storm, keep your head held up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on. Walk on with hope in your heart 
and you'll never walk alone. My friends, we are in this together. We are connected with one another in both our brokenness and in our unity. We can heal the world and with each other as we live in covenant with God and each other. We can produce the fruits of the kingdom as we work to create God's justice. As we come together this World Communion Sunday, may we remember the many people around the world who work and walk with us to create unity and justice. May we remember that we do not walk alone. Amen. together. O Holy One, we give you thanks this day for the many celebrations that we have participated in this week, for the birthdays and anniversaries, for ordination celebrations, and for the ways that people have found to connect across the distances that continue to, to divide us. And God, we also lift this day all those who need your healing, those who are ill with COVID-19, as well as those who 
are fighting cancer and other illnesses. We ask for your presence with those who are suffering, with those who are anxious, with those who are lonely, with those who are finding that this continued separation is taking a toll on their ability to cope. And especially this day, God, we lift those who are in the midst of war in Armenia and Azerbaijan. We ask for their safety. As well, we ask prayers for our own political landscape in this country. We ask that we might be more aware of our unity through you than of our divisiveness and on the issues that may divide us. We ask that you would teach us that there is strength in diversity of traditions within our country. And God, we ask for wisdom for our leaders, especially leaders in schools who have the safety of our children under their control. We ask also for wisdom for business leaders, for leaders of transportation, utilities, and especially for leaders in hospitals and healthcare workers. And God, we lift this day your planet and the many ways that Earth is suffering. We ask that you would send us to heal some of what ails this planet. And we ask as well that your presence would be with all those who are suffering the aftermath of fires, that your presence would be with those who are having to flee their homes due to storms, those who have lost loved ones in hurricanes, those who have lost property. We ask that you would walk through the days following earthquakes and the many who have experienced loss of property due to earthquakes. And we ask as well for your wisdom in situations where habitat is being destroyed and species face endangered status or extinction. God, we know that you are already present in all of these situations and places with all of these people. And yet we pray because we know that prayer changes us and that we know that you are there if we would just pay attention. And we pray this day together using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to this time in our service, the offering moment. We are so thankful for the many ways that you are already offering yourselves and your gifts to those in need around us. We know also that our church is open, even though the building is closed and that the church continues to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in this time. If this is a week that you would like to give financially to your church, you may do so in two ways. Either you can give online using our web address, or you can send a check to our secure mailing address, and that address is on your screen at this time. We're so thankful to be in ministry with you. Hi, I'm Reverend Kathy Morse. I've been invited to, um, to begin the season of stewardship this morning with you. And I thought what I'd like to do is take you back to my own story of giving. About 50 years ago, a United Methodist pastor in El Cajon, California, issued a challenge to the members of our congregation. He challenged us to try tithing, giving 10% of our income to God. And he quoted from Malachi, the third chapter, and said, 
Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And it said, he told us that's the only place in the Bible that we're told to test God. And it continues, see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. And then he added to that challenge um, a guarantee. He said, if you try tithing and you find that you're not able to make your payments or that you need your money back, we will gladly refund any money that you've given us that you need. And he said, my own experience with tithing says I probably won't have to do that, but I want you to be comfortable. Well, the next thing he said was, and I promise that you will grow in your faith. I was a young woman then. My husband and I were living on $600 a month, and I was, we were putting me through college with that $600 a month. And we looked at each other and thought, that's nuts, but let's try it. And we thought maybe we should just give 10% of our net income. So that's what we did, 10% of our net income. And sure enough, it didn't take hardly any time for us to find that we were short on funds. But that's when God began to surprise us. And we couldn't believe the surprising, amazing ways that God provided for our needs. After a while, we said, you know, this is crazy. We should be giving 10% of our gross income. And so we started doing that. And there were times when money was really tight, but God always provided for us and always surprised us. What we learned was that God could do more with 90% of our income than we could do with 100%. It began to be a real cornerstone of our faith. And what I learned in that time is that tithing is a spiritual discipline and my spiritual disciplines have come and gone over the years. I'm not always faithful in my prayer life, and I have not always kept the Sabbath, and I have never fasted. But the easiest spiritual discipline that we do is to write a check every week. And it has given us so much joy over the years. One of the other things that we've learned is to move from um, uh, an idea of scarcity, that there's not ever enough, to an assurance of abundance. And not just that there will be enough, but that there will be more than enough to meet our needs and the needs of the community around us. We have learned that tithing is a cornerstone of our faith, and it has been part of our joyful um, Steward, stewardship experience, our joyful discipleship experience. Um, and, and I think Steve would tell you the same. So what I'd like to do today is to offer you the challenge that that pastor offered to us over 50 years ago, or almost 50 years ago. And, and it's because of that 50 years of experience that I feel comfortable saying this, that if you try tithing, and you can't make it that something happens and you need that money, we will gladly give you that money back, whatever you have given that you need. But my experience says that you're not going to have to do that. My experience says that you will never be sorry that you started tithing. Instead, you will always be blessed. Blessings on you today. May God be with you. And, and also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them up, up to God. God. Let us give thanks to God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give God, God thanks and, and praise. praise. It is good to give thanks and praise to God wherever we are. God has been with us since the beginning of time. God has traveled with us all the places we have gone. And God has heard us whenever we have cried out. Long ago, O oh God, you took care of baby Moses, and through the love of his sister and his mother and the princess of Egypt, 
you kept him safe. Thank, Thank you, God, God for, for being, being with us. us. You called to Moses from the burning bush and sent him to lead your people to freedom. You traveled with the people as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. And you led them out of slavery and into freedom. Thank, Thank you, God, God for, for being with us. us. You led your people across the sea on dry ground. Moses and Miriam and all the people sang songs of praise to you as they wandered in the desert. You were with them. Thank, Thank you, God, for being with us. When the people complained, you did not turn your back. When they were hungry, you sent them food. And when they were thirsty, you gave them water to drink. Thank, Thank you, God, God for, for being, being with, with us. You gave us your laws, sweeter than honeycomb, to guide us and keep us from sin. And when we break your laws, you forgive us. Thank, Thank you, God, for, for being, being with, with us. us. You sent Jesus to be our friend, our teacher, our savior. When we ignore his teachings and do not follow in his ways, you still love us. And so we say with all the people everywhere, Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. We remember now, on the night before he died, that Jesus sat at the table with his friends, celebrating the Passover feast. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine and blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And so we do, as Jesus told us. We share the bread and the cup as millions of your followers around the world also do on this day, remembering your wonderful love for us in Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on all your people. Bless this bread and this juice that they, may be, they might refresh us and renew us as Christ's body in the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we invite you to take the bread that you have at your house or a cracker or whatever snack you have around and to give thanks to God for that snack and to break it and to share it with all those that are around you and to take it into your body. And then to do the same with the juice or whatever drink you have at your place where you're uh, worshiping and to, again, take that into your body. The bread of heaven. Amen. The cup of joy. Amen. The bread of life. And the cup of blessing. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for all of the many ways that you continue to nourish us. And on this World Communion Sunday, we pray that we may feel connected with our sisters and brothers in Christ around the world, and that we may continue to work in Christian unity, ecumenical cooperation, to share your justice and your mercy with the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace, grace.
Hear our benediction. As we leave this sacred space, may we live in Christian unity and engage in ecumenical cooperation. May we remember that God and the community of faith walk with us, especially in the unexpected storms of life. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in God, that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>